Uh, our next speaker is Anjana, our first speaker. Um, she's currently f living in Berlin, but she's going to flee back to the United States to San Francisco. And she's a philosophy major, yeah? And then uh, switched to English, and then finally programming. Seems like no one wants to do programming right away. So uh, let's have a warm welcome for Anjana. I have no idea where your slides are. I'm so oh, okay, sorry. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Good morning. How y'all doing? Had coffee, hopefully. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm Anjana Vakil. Hi. Um, as Steve just mentioned, I uh, I was indeed a philosophy student at one point. It was a while ago, uh, and then I was uh, an English teacher, and then I was a computational linguist, and now I'm a software developer. And so I'm here to talk to you about programming paradigms, or more specifically, programming across paradigms. So because I used to be a philosophy major, I like to get a little bit big picture, and uh, nothing starts off a web development conference, right? Like a little philosophy early in the morning. So we're going to get a little abstract, and I'd like to um, have a conversation with you all about how programming paradigms influence the way we write code. So we'll start off with kind of some big picture thinking about paradigms and what they are. Then we'll take a look at some particular examples of paradigms, perhaps ones that we all use, perhaps ones that are new to you. And then at the end of the talk, we'll take a look at some specific examples of how bringing different paradigms into your code can make it better. So um, just first, a little bit about me. Well, I'm, um, as I said, Anjana Vakil. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is easy to remember because it's my name. Right now, as of a week ago, I uh, am a member of Mapbox. I'm engineering, learning, and development lead there. And we build great tools to help you put amazing maps and build location experiences in your great websites. So um, feel free to come talk to me or my colleague Lauren about Mapbox if you're curious. And I'd also like to share with you a couple of awesome uh, programming communities that I'm lucky to be an alumna of. One is the Recurse Center. This is an amazing community and programming retreat based in New York City, where you can go for a period of about six weeks or three months to work on whatever you want to work on to make yourself a better programmer. Basically, learn whatever you want. So it's a fantastic place to explore things like programming paradigms. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today were kind of these explorations that I got to do while at the Recurse Center. So check it out if you're curious. It's recurse.com. Another initiative that I'm really lucky to have been a, a member of is the Outreachy program. This is a fantastic program to offer paid remote internships in open source at organizations like Mozilla to members of underrepresented groups in technology. And basically, it allows you to work with fantastic organizations for three months. So if you know anyone that is underrepresented or comes from a group that's underrepresented in tech and is looking for an internship in open source, send them to outreachy.org. And if you run an open source uh, community or program or a company that works in open source and you'd like to sponsor an intern, also check out outreachy.org. And uh, I did my internship at Mozilla. I don't think I need to introduce Mozilla to you. And I'm also still a volunteer and contributor with Mozilla as a tech speaker. So you can find me at a lot of web conferences around town, so uh, never hesitate to say hello. OK, but we're not here to talk about me for an hour. We're here to talk about programming paradigms. So when I was at the Recurse Center, I started learning a new paradigm for me, which was functional programming. And when I started learning this new paradigm, I had worked in imperative and object-oriented code before, I got really curious about what is a programming paradigm? Where does this idea of a programming paradigm come from? And I found out that the first time it kind of came to the forefront of public attention in the computer science community was in 1978, when this guy, Robert Floyd, won the Turing Award. And he decided to dedicate his Turing Award lecture and the subsequent paper, which came out the following year, as you see here, to the paradigms of programming. Now, he thought that this was important enough to dedicate his one, well, 
I don't know if people win the Turing Award multiple times in a lifetime, I don't think so, but his one Turing Award lecture, Two Programming Paradigms. And this paper, although it was written in 1978, it reads very, very uh, contemporary today. I feel it's still very relevant. And what he says is that the reason he wants to talk about programming paradigms is he believes the best chance we have to improve the general practice of programming is to attend to our paradigms. I think this is great, and I have to say I agree with him. I think the paradigm, as opposed to, let's say, a framework or an algorithm or a language, is a unit of abstraction, a layer of abstraction that it makes sense to think about uh, because it has a huge impact on how we do programming. In fact, we could say it sort of defines how we do programming. But OK, I've used the word paradigm probably about 80 times so far, and it's like five minutes into the talk. What am I talking about? What is a paradigm? So this is a big word. It's particularly big right now. Um, and the first time that I ran into it uh, was indeed when studying philosophy. And in my philosophy of science class, we read this book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's by a guy named Thomas Kuhn. And he's kind of, he's a philosopher of science. He's kind of a historian of science. And in this book, he tries to give an account of how we as a community, as a civilization, make scientific progress. And the way this book lays it out is it kind of all revolves around the notion of a paradigm. So what is a paradigm? Well, he basically lays out a paradigm as being a worldview, a way of understanding the universe, the world around us. And as a scientist, the way of understanding the universe that you're interested in, in your particular branch of science. So if you're a physicist, maybe the world that you're interested in is the literal world, the universe, all of matter and being and time and existence. If you're a medical doctor, maybe the universe that you're interested in is the human body or perhaps populations of humans. And if you're a computer scientist or a programmer, like most of us, the universe or the world that you're interested in is the computer and computer programs and how they work. And a paradigm basically gives you a conceptual framework, a way of looking at that world, a way of understanding that world, within which you can do science. You can make progress and further your understanding, further all of our understanding of how that world works. And so in this sense, a paradigm could also be understood as a model of the world that you're interested in. A model being not an accurate representation of that world, but a conceptual representation of that world that lets us think about it clearly. And it's important to note this separation between model and reality. And this brings up the classic quote from statistician George E.P. Box. Don't know if you've heard this before, but he famously said, all models are wrong. They're all wrong. A model, by definition, is just an approximation or a shorthand for the reality that it's trying to describe. But, he says, some models are useful. And this is kind of what Thomas Kuhn is getting at, about how paradigms, these models, help us make progress as a scientific community. Basically, he lays out a structure in which a paradigm enables that progress. Without a paradigm, we can't really do anything. So he talks about this um, as being a mixture of three different things. He says the scientist acquires theory, methods, and standards together in this inextricable mixture. So what does he mean here by theory, methods, and standards of science? So the theory is kind of this world, this model of what the universe is made up of, what entities it contains, and how those entities behave and interact with one another. And the methods and standards that go along with that kind of define what the act of doing science looks like. So methods, like, uh, methods and standards being figuring out which problems are worth solving. Another way of phrasing that would be which questions are worth asking and which solutions to those problems or which answers to those questions are legitimate, which answers would be good answers. And so all of these three together, the theory, the methods, and standards kind of make up science. 
And this is how a paradigm enables scientific progress. He talks about this pre-science world, this pre-science phase, as being this kind of dark time. We don't have a paradigm yet. All we have is a bunch of individuals, maybe one person over here has their own kind of model of the universe and is making their own experiments, but it's totally different from this person over here who's got a different model and is making different experiments, asking different questions, getting different answers, and we're all kind of fumbling around in the dark, and no one is really getting anywhere because we can't leverage the work of the community. We can't leverage each other. We're in isolation, not that effective. Until, let there be paradigm. So, at a certain point, what, what Kuhn says is that the scientific community, for one reason or another, decides to all get on board, get behind a particular model. And once there's some kind of consensus, um, this model becomes a dominant paradigm. And within the structure of that, that framework, that theory, the methods and standards that go well along with it, we are able, as a community, to start working with each other, exchanging knowledge, leveraging each other's experiments and making progress and furthering our understanding. Okay, this has been a lot of abstract talk so far. A concrete example of a paradigm might be, in physics or cosmology, might be this, the uh, Ptolemaic model of the universe in which the Earth, planet Earth, our beloved home, is this like warm, beating heart of the universe and all of the celestial objects, the sun and stars and planets and moon, all re literally revolve around us in these spheres in the sky. Now, we now know that this model is wrong. All models are wrong, but this one's like particularly wrong. But at the time, it was very useful to the scientific community. People were able to start making progress, start furthering their understanding of the cosmos. Um, there were lots of experiments, we got lots of, of literature developing, but eventually there started to become things that this model couldn't explain because it's wrong, which we know now. For example, Mars, right, looks in the sky like it goes backwards for a little bit. The retrograde motion of Mars in the sky was a thing that this paradigm couldn't really explain well. And Kuhn talks about that as an anomaly for the paradigm. It's something that the model doesn't quite fit or doesn't quite fit the model, but what happens is that people start trying to shoehorn it into the model anyway. They start trying to come up with ex like lavish constructions and elaborate apparatus to explain these anomalies. So for example, like epicycles of orbits around orbits and these weird constructions that, uh, yeah, okay, we could sort of explain it, but it doesn't quite fit. And eventually more and more of these anomalies uh, are found, and it becomes harder and harder to reconcile them with the model, and eventually the scientific community gets thrown into a phase of crisis, where now we've got some people saying, well, this model is just wrong, it can't explain all these things, and other people, old guards of the models of the paradigm, saying, yes, it can, we just need all of these complex constructions, and rah, 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 you're wrong, no, you're wrong, meh, and basically everyone is too busy arguing to do any science. So this is a dark time as well, until the community experiences a moment of shift. And this is when a new model comes along, like, for example, the Copernican model of a heliocentric universe where the sun is at the center and the Earth and all of the other planets revolve around it. Uh, a model like this comes along that can much better explain the anomalies of the previous paradigm. So Mars moving backwards is easy to explain when you imagine the Earth at the center and all the planets moving around it. And eventually, sometimes it takes hundreds of years, as was the case with this particular problem, eventually this becomes the new dominant paradigm. But it's a model, it's still wrong, it's gonna have new anomalies, those are gonna lead to a moment of crisis, that's gonna lead to a new shift and a new paradigm, and so on and so forth forever. And this Kuhn says, is how we as a community can progress. We just have to keep going through all of these different paradigms. This is good, this is progress. Okay, but we're not here to talk about philosophy of science, although I've made you do it now for the last 15 minutes or whatever. Um, we're here to talk about programming. So, I'm gonna let you the, ponder this big question while I take a sip of water. What is programming? If programming is the world that we as programmers are concerned with, 
what would we need to explain in our paradigm? So this is the question, basically, that each different programming paradigm seeks to answer. What is the universe of a computer program? What is it made up of? And those things that make it up, how do they interact? How do they behave? So just like in cosmology, as programmers, we also, as a community, experienced a dark time before computers where we couldn't write programs. Well, some people did, like Ada Lovelace wrote like theoretical programs. And, uh, people like, uh, like Alan Church came up with theoretical models of computation. But until we had kind of a, a concrete computer to start doing programs on, it was pretty difficult. So lo and behold, somehow, as a species, as a civilization, we figured out how to basically like take a pile of rocks and electrocute it and make it do whatever we want. And the computer was born, and so was programming. And came with it our first programming paradigm, or what we now today would consider kind of the first major programming paradigm, which would be imperative programming. So in imperative programming, what is a program? What is the world of a program made up of? Well, it's made up of imperative commands. I, as the programmer, tell the computer, follow my instructions. Do this, and then do that and then do this other thing. Remember this number, and then remember this other number, and then add them together, or what have you. And so programming becomes the act of giving commands to the computer, giving instructions to the computer. And we, importantly, have to tell the computer not just do what I say, but do what I say in the order that I tell you to do it. Follow my commands in the order that I give them. And so with that, we have this notion of values changing over time. Time becomes important. I say, remember this value, and then later change it to this value, and then give me that value back. And so values changing over time is state. So in imperative programming, remembering state is an important part of programs. So state becomes part of the world, the universe of the computer program. Now, I don't know about you, but I am like a very visual person, visual learner, so I like to have visual metaphors for things to help me understand them better. And the visual metaphor that I like to use in my mind for imperative programming is like a complex machine, like a clock or a watch. Um, where, and this is kind of how I imagine an imperative programming. It's composed of all of these very intricately arranged little parts, little wheels and levers and things that all fit together in this very perfect, precise way to make the machine work. And it works. It does, it tells time, but it's very kind of rigid, and if one little part breaks, then the whole thing breaks down. Or if one little part changes, then you'd have to change all the other wheels that it's connected to. And so it is basically a very kind of hard to maintain type of machine. And so a lot of people found that this was sort of an anomaly for the paradigm of imperative programming, and sought to solve it in different ways. Sorry, I'm just going to adjust this. Technology. OK. Um, so this anomaly of maintenance of programs led to a couple of other paradigms uh, emerging and this kind of shift happening. One of them would be object-oriented programming. So this we could understand as sort of a, a continuation of imperative programming. In this world, we still give commands to the computer, but we don't really think about the program as being made up of commands. We think about it being made up of objects where an object is just kind of a little package, a little unit that has some state internally. It has some chunk of the state of our program that it remembers. And so we as programmers, we tell our objects, OK, you remember this little part of the program. You keep that state, remember it, and keep it to yourself. Keep it hidden. Don't expose it to the rest of the objects in the program. And what we do then is we make calls to objects with methods, right? We make method calls on objects. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but one of the founding fathers of the object-oriented paradigm, Alan Kay, he says that the, the most important thing is messaging. And um, the idea that when we make a method call on an object, what we're really doing is sending a message to that object. And we're telling it, OK, object, listen for my messages. Listen for the method calls that I make to you. And when you get them, respond as you see fit based on the state that you have 
and the methods that you know how to handle. So that could be maybe changing something internally, it could be sending out a, a response, sending a, a value or something like that. Uh, whatever that is, just listen for my messages, keep your little state, and respond to me as needed. And so the visual metaphor for this comes also from Alan Kay. He thinks of objects in a, an object-oriented program as kind of like cells in a body or in a tissue, um, where each object is like a little cell that has its own contents, its own little organelles and, and little uh, units of state in there. And the cells send and receive messages just like our cells send messages with molecules passing back and forth across their membranes. And from these little cells, we are able to compose a tissue. And then many tissues compose a body. And so we are able to construct a much more complex program out of these little objects. So this is kind of uh, the idea behind object-oriented programming, is thinking about the world of the program in terms of these cell-like objects instead of commands and instructions. But that's not the only way we could consider a program. Uh, perhaps some of you are also familiar with the functional programming paradigm. So in the functional programming paradigm, this is also a rejection of this anomaly of uh, maintaining a really complex program in imperative style. And functional programming looks at the world of the program as being made up of pure functions. The reason that we focus more on pure functions is this idea that, OK, remember all of that state and all of the time importance in, in imperative programming? That's hard. That's dangerous. Humans are bad at managing that kind of thing. But pure functions, functions that all they look at is the input that they get, the arguments that you pass to them, and all they do is use that input to do some kind of computation and return a new value. They don't change anything. They don't mutate any global state. They just take in input, do some computation, and return an output. And this, these pure functions, those are safe because you're not having to keep in your head all of the state of a complex program. All you have to worry about if you're a pure function is your input and returning your output. And so pure functions can also be thought of as kind of like data processors. Data comes in through the arguments passed to a function, and data goes out, the return value. And that's all a function is. And in, in functional programming, all a program is is a bunch of pure functions all linked up together. And so the visual metaphor I like for this is an assembly line. This is kind of what a functional, programming start, a functional program starts to feel like. Coming into the factory, you get a bunch of like raw material, like metal, let's say. And then you have a station where that metal gets turned into sheets. And then you have another station that takes in metal sheets and bends them into pieces of a car. And then you have another station that takes in pieces of a car and like bolts them together, I guess. I don't really know how cars are made. But anyway, puts them together into the body of a car. And then you have another station that puts on wheels, and another one that puts on glass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so your program becomes kind of like a pipeline, kind of like an assembly line for data just flowing through. Now, functional programming is uh, often referred to as a sort of sub-paradigm of a larger paradigm called declarative programming which is often contrasted with imperative programming, uh, where imperative programming is giving commands, right? Do this, do that, the imperative grammatical voice. Declarative programming thinks about a program as being made up of declarative statements. Um, so for example, logic programming is another example of a declarative paradigm. So in declarative programming, I just make statements about the world. I say, computer, these are the facts. These are the things that I know, the things I know to be true. For example, these are a bunch of phone numbers and the, the names of the people who have these phone numbers. These are the facts. And then I say, this is what I would like. And you could think of this kind of like if anyone uh, you know, um, has heard of SQL being a declarative language. SQL is often used as sort of the archetypal declarative programming language. We say with a SQL query, this is what I want. I want the phone numbers of people whose names start with A, something like that. 
But importantly, I don't tell the computer how I want it to get those for me. I don't tell it how I want to do anything, like I did in imperative programming where I say, first do this, and then do that, and then do this other thing. Follow my instructions exactly. Instead, I just say, this is what I would like. I would really like it, computer, if you would please give me this. Thank you very much. And that's it. And so this is a little bit like, I think, a Sudoku game. Anybody play Sudoku? No? A couple, like one, like five, okay, five people? All right, well, you can ask them for more details. But basically, in a Sudoku game, you are the computer. And I give you a sheet like this, a sheet of paper that has a grid on it, and it has some facts about the world. Like, there is a one in the top left corner, and there is a six in the top right corner, et cetera, et cetera. And I tell you what I want. What I want is a completed grid with numbers in all of the squares, such that every row has the numbers 1 through 9, and every column has the numbers 1 through 9, and every sub-square has the numbers 1 through 9. What I don't tell you is how I want you to fill out the grid. Your job is just to figure it out and fill out the grid in the right way. I don't care if you do it in pencil, in pen. I don't care if you guess. I don't care if you just stare at it for three hours and then fill it all in at once. I don't care. Just do it. So this is sort of what it's like to be a computer if your program is written in a declarative paradigm. So these are just a few examples of programming paradigms. Are they all of the paradigms? By no means. In fact, they're not even all of the principal programming paradigms, which this guy, Peter Van Roy, took it upon himself to catalog in great detail. Don't worry, you don't have to read this chart. It's, uh, it's got a lot of information on it. You can, if you're curious, you can go to that URL and, uh, and find this chart and a lot of interesting, uh, his interesting writing. His work is quite interesting because it breaks down programming paradigms into concepts that compose them. And he talks about languages that support each of these paradigms. And what comes out of this that's fascinating is that there are so many different paradigms. And yet, sometimes, paradigms that are typically thought of as being diametrically opposed, like mortal enemies, like functional programming and object-oriented programming, for example, which if you've ever been on Hacker News, you would think there is like some kind of blood feud between these two paradigms. They can never meet. Uh, it's not that really like that. Peter Van Roy says that these two paradigms are really only separated by one little concept that differs between them. And so this, when I, when I read this, I started asking myself, OK, how different are these paradigms really? Now, we could ask this of any pair or any set of programming paradigms, but because of this you know, death feud between the functional programming camp and the object-oriented camp, I think it's interesting to talk about those two in particular. So are they really so different? OK, quick show of hands. Do we have any uh, functional programmers in the audience? Couple, couple folks, OK. Object-oriented programmers? Lots of folks. OK, cool. Uh, people who don't really care? Yep, OK, what I was expecting, pretty much everyone. So <laughs> often, you'll hear about these paradigms as being really, really different. But the people who don't really care, perhaps they're onto something. Because it seems that actually they have a lot in common. So we said that imperative programming has this anomaly, this problem of shared mutable state. Basically, when you have a complex program, you have to pay attention to the way values change through that program, and that's state. And because values can, can be mutated, can be changed in place, if I change a value over here in the program, my colleague over there might be like, ah, what happened? Who changed this? Ah, my code doesn't work anymore. It causes problems, because we're sharing that state. So this is an anomaly that both the object-oriented and functional paradigms are trying to account for, are trying to provide a better explanation for, or a better way of dealing with. It's just that they do it in slightly different ways. So whereas functional programming rejects the notion of state entirely, it says, hey, let's just not make values be able to be changed at all. Let's just reject mutation. If we make our, computer, our programs up out of pure functions, 
then all a function does is it takes in some values and it returns a new value. It never changes the old value and it never changes anything outside of itself, any kind of global state. So if we're not mutating anything, if we're not changing anything, then you can share things as much as you want. It doesn't matter because they're never changing. Whereas object-oriented programming keeps the state idea. It says, okay, mutable state is okay, it's fine, as long as we don't share it. So it rejects the sharing part of things. As long as we take our state and we break it up into little units that we call objects, then it'll be fine because each object can just be responsible for its own chunk of the state. And so these two are really trying to solve the same problem. They're just doing it in slightly different ways. And I mentioned earlier Alan Kay. Um, he said that, I'm sorry that I long ago coined the term objects for this topic, object-oriented programming, because it gets many people to focus on the lesser idea. The big idea is messaging. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Now, this was something I misunderstood for years about object-oriented programming. I learned about object-oriented programming in my first like programming classes as being about classes and hierarchies and you know zoo animals inheriting things from each other. Turns out, it's not really about that. It's about little cells sending messages to each other. And so, in Alan Kay's world, as I mentioned earlier, an object is defined, basically, by how it responds to messages. What messages it knows how to respond to and what responses it gives. And in functional programming, we said, a function, all it does is take input and give output so it's sort of defined by what output it gives given a certain input. And pure functions, if you give them the same input, they always return the same output. And so in both of these paradigms, we're really talking about these units of the program, these entities that make up the program, as being defined in terms of their behavior, in terms of how they behave, what, how they respond when you give them input or when you send them a message. And what totally blew me away was when I learned that in the lambda calculus, which is sort of the quintessential, like most perfect functional programming theoretical kind of uh, language or model of computation, and uh, if you've ever encountered a functional programming language, you'll know that all of their logos are lambdas. So this functional construct, it defines values in terms of how they behave to their inputs. So in the lambda calculus, we could define the value true as being a thing that takes a first argument and takes a second argument and gives you the first argument. Whereas false is a thing that takes a first argument and takes a second argument and gives you the second argument. And it totally blew my mind when I discovered that in small talk, which is often considered this kind of quintessential object-oriented language, also developed by Alan Kay, among others. In small talk, this is almost exactly how Boolean values are defined. True is just something that has a first thing and a second thing and gives you the first thing. And false is, a, is something that takes a first thing and a second thing and gives you the second thing. They're exactly the same. I don't know about you, but this totally blew my mind. And it turns out that you can do object-oriented programming in the lambda calculus. Like, you can write an object-oriented program. Closures and objects are pretty similar. So the point of this is that when we ask this question, which paradigm is the best that people seem to so often be concerned with, not all those people who raised their hands before, but the others. <laughs> when we ask this question, there is no best paradigm. Just like we saw before, George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Just like in physics, Einstein sort of proved Newton's model wrong. And Einstein's model is super useful for if you're trying to, you know, talk about the, the age of the universe and stuff like that. Newton's model doesn't stop being useful when it's time to build a bridge or like calculate what happens to billiard balls on a table, we still use Newton's model for a lot of things. It's still very useful. And in the same way, programming paradigms all have their uses. So instead of asking, is the model true or is this programming paradigm good, we should be asking, is the model illuminating and useful? 
Or is this paradigm useful for solving a certain type of programming problem? Can it teach me something? Can I get something out of it? And we can all get something out of all of the different paradigms. So the question that I hope you'll all take away from this when you go out and learn a new language or learn a new paradigm or have a new problem to solve in your work is what can a given paradigm illuminate for me? What can a paradigm do for me? What can it teach me? So the imperative paradigm, I think, it can, it's a really good teacher of how to be explicit, how to focus on the implementational details, and in doing so, how to write code that's very machine efficient, how to think like a computer, because our, our poor little computers, they're sort of stuck in this paradigm. They don't get all the nice layers of abstraction that we humans can get from other paradigms. And so sometimes this is something that you need to do even when you're used to thinking on a higher level in a different level of abstraction. So for example, Elixir is a functional web language that uh, so maybe some folks were at the workshop the other day. If you weren't at the workshop and you want to talk about Elixir, go find Sasha. I don't know where he is, but he's an expert. So Elixir is a very cool functional language that allows you to uh, include uh, functions from other languages. These are called NIFs. I believe that stands for Native Implemented Function. And you can write a NIF, which is nifty, in a language that supports a different paradigm. Like, for example, Rust, an imperative language. So if I am writing some Elixir code, but I have some component that needs to be very performant, where performance is really, really important, I might choose to drop down to an imperative language like Rust and do my complicated math, like maybe I have a really, really exciting add function where I have to do a bunch of complicated instructions to add two numbers together, I don't know. And if I do need to be very conscious of the performance there, I can do it in a language, or in a paradigm rather, that allows me to be conscious of that performance, the machine performance. So that's pretty cool. This is a language that supports then different paradigms. What about declarative programming? What can that teach us? Well, this basically is the opposite. It can teach us, instead of being very low level, it teaches us to be very abstract. It shows us how to focus on the domain that we're trying to model in our program and how to write code that's human efficient, that's good for humans that humans can process quickly, as opposed to imperative code that machines can process quickly. So often you'll find um, things like domain-specific languages being very declarative. This is an example taken from a book on domain-specific languages by uh, Martin Fowler and Rebecca Parsons, uh, where working in an object-oriented language like Java, we can actually use a subset of the syntax to create what sort of starts to feel like a different language, like a domain-specific language. This is what Fowler calls an embedded DSL, uh, because it's using a subset of the syntax of the host language, Java in this case. And what it does is it allows us to, to talk, in a sense, about our domain, like a calendar, in a very declarative way. I can say, OK, calendar, I have this event, and I have this other event, and I have this other event, and I would like to know what I have coming up on uh, next week. And this allows us to write code that's very easy for humans to look at and process. So both of these teach us useful different things. Similarly, object-oriented programming has something useful to teach us, which is how to encapsulate knowledge about the world state and how to remember that in a, a way that's sometimes useful when you're working in, for example, a language like F-sharp, which is sort of functional first, but also supports object-oriented programming. Um, this is from a blog post um, by Eric Tsarpolis, which where he talks about why OOP matters, even in a functional language like F-sharp. Um, and so one perhaps anomaly of functional programming is that when you have, uh, let's say you're trying to define an API and you have a bunch of dependencies, each function in that module would have to take all of those dependencies as its inputs. So that starts to lead to these really, really long and ugly uh, function signatures and function calls. That's no fun. Um, and this is, could be considered sort of an anomaly for functional programming. Whereas, if you wrap that all up in just a simple kind of class-like structure, where you have, uh, you create this API and you pass in all those dependencies once, and then each of the functions becomes a method on that object, which 
automatically knows about all of the dependencies, um, this is perhaps a much cleaner, nicer, easier way to write your programs. And as I said before, functional programming, object-oriented programming, the line is blurry, you could do a closure, you could write an object, but the point is, doing things in pure functions might not always make sense. Sometimes it might be useful to drop to OOP or move to OOP. Similarly, functional programming has a lot that it can teach us, like how to isolate things so that each part of your code is only doing one specific thing and to focus in your programs on how data is transformed. We talked about this assembly line, that your program becomes a series of transformations of data, and so you start to think about how the data flows through your program. Um, there's a great uh, blog post, and also there's a, an associated conference talk by Jessica Kerr, uh, in which she talks about She's an object-oriented programmer, and well, now she does a lot of different paradigms, but she's trying to write an object-oriented program, and she's creating this uh, diagram on the whiteboard of how this program should work, and this is what you see on your left here. And she realizes in writing this diagram that when she's trying to think about this in an object-oriented way, she has to create all these complex, like, okay, first you do this, and then you check this, and if that's it, then you go around, and if you don't have this, and then, and then you have to go back, and it becomes very difficult to kind of hold in your mind all at once. And she's trying to hand this pro project off to her team. It becomes hard to see how you would divide that into useful uh, kind of projects that you could hand out to your team members. Whereas, she says, when she starts to think in a functional way about this project, then the structure becomes much cleaner. She starts to think about the data sources coming in and how that data is going to be processed and merged together and further processed to create the end result that we want. And so this becomes a much cleaner structure, which is also much easier to chop into tasks, which you can then hand off to separate people on your team. So the point here that I want to make is just like Peter Van Roy says, each paradigm supports a set of concepts, or is good at doing certain things, that makes it the best for a certain kind of problem. Each paradigm, and by virtue of that, each language that supports different paradigms, is good for doing certain things. As we said, no paradigm is best absolutely. There is no the best paradigm. Each is best for a certain type of problem, a certain case, a certain situation. So if you work in a multi-paradigm language, a language that supports different paradigms, then you have a really good shot of being able to find the paradigm that's the best fit for your particular problem. So what has my point been? All this talk of abstractions and paradigms and philosophy and cells, blah, blah, blah. This is really the thing I would like to take you away, I'd like you to take away, which is that paradigms enable us to do programming, just like Kuhn said, paradigms enable science. And going along with that, paradigms define what programming is, what a program is, and what your job as a programmer is. Is it to give commands? Is it to make declarative statements? Is it to transform data? Paradigms define what that is. And so the important thing is when you're working in a certain paradigm, to embrace it for what it is and not try to fight it, and not try to make it do things that it's not meant to do, and try to shoehorn those weird anomalies into it. Instead, be open to shifting your paradigm, a, a different paradigm that your language supports, or maybe learning a new language that supports a new paradigm for you. Because that might be the best fit for a certain problem. When you find yourself writing really, really ugly, complex code, think about it. Is there a different paradigm under which this ugly program would become much more elegant and much easier for me to deal with. So going back to Robert Floyd from the, from the Turing lecture paper that we saw at the beginning, he says that the advancement of the general art of programming requires the continuing invention and elaboration of paradigms. We as a community, we need to come up with new paradigms so that we have even more tools to solve even more problems. And he says, even though he got a little bit confused about how gender and pronouns work in English, so I fixed it for him. He says that advancement of the art of individual programmers requires that they expand their repertory of, programming, of paradigms. So we, as individuals, we are responsible for going out and learning about all the tools that the community has already invented to solve as many different problems as possible. 
So hopefully what you take away from this is a little bit of inspiration and motivation to go out to the talks in this awesome conference, which are going to cover a huge range of material, to go out and learn new paradigms, paradigms that are, learned, that are new to you. And hopefully we can all put our heads together and come up with some new paradigms because, you know, we only have like 8 million that Peter Van Roy put on that chart. We need 9 million. So let's attend to our paradigms. Kvala. We have uh, time for questions, so if someone has a question. Oh, I'm just going to put some, yeah. uh, oh. these are some references up there. I'll also tweet out these slides, so don't worry about writing those. S speaking of Twitter, I forgot to mention the most important thing, our hashtag for this conference, which is WCZG, which is short for Webcamp Zagreb, so that's super important. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we have uh, 15 minutes for questions, so. Ooh, that's a lot questions? of time. We yeah. could also make that 15 minutes, minutes for coffee. 10 minutes, 5 minutes. 5 minutes for questions, 10 minutes yeah. for coffee. We, we, have a, we have a division break after this, which is a half an hour long, so Ooh. tons of coffee. That's time. a lot of coffee. Yeah. Good thing we're all programmers. Yes. Uh, so questions? Anyone? Way in the back here. Make sure you ask questions from different up. parts of the audience. It gives Steve his exercise. Yep. Thanks. Keep him on his toes. I, I couldn't fit into my suit this year, so I probably <laughs> need it. Hello, thank you for a very nice lecture. Um, Thanks for listening. Wor working as a software developer, I can't help but wonder where are all these new fancy paradigms, because it feels like we're recycling things that are 20 or 40 years old. It does feel that way sometimes, doesn't it? A lot of people say this, a lot of people are feeling that same thing, and I think this is exactly what Floyd was talking about in 1978. He was saying, we need new tools for this. And so, yeah, we should really like, kind of take a look at ourselves as a community and be like, all right, we need to try to think outside the box here and come up with some new, different ways of doing things. Um, however, there are a lot of, uh, of new languages coming out that, that enable at least as many different types of paradigms as possible. Like, for example, that, that example I showed with Elixir, allowing us to drop down to other languages um, or to, to move over to other languages. Languages like F Sharp, where we have functional and object-oriented. These are great, but we also need to start thinking about how we could create new entire models, new, new ways of conceptualizing what a program could be, how we could construct a program, what entities it could be made up of. I have no idea what those new paradigms could look like, but this is you know, something that we as a community it would be great if we could spend more attention on and put more effort into that. So if you, wanna, you know, if you have an idea and you want to get some folks together, rally behind you and cause a new paradigm shift in programming, Floyd and me, are, we're all for it. More questions? Questions? Okay, I have one. If you, if you had to pick your favorite paradigm. Did you not listen to my talk, Steve? <laughs> <sighs> I have to give the whole thing again. All right, here we go. No. What, what's, your, uh, what's your primary programming language? My primary programming language? Yes. So, um, I, well, I guess I have two. My primary one for the last couple of years has been uh, Python, which is great because it does support multiple paradigms. Turns out you can even do functional programming in, paradigm. in Python. Who knew? However, it is fundamentally an object-oriented language. In Python, you can't really ever get super far away from the object as an abstraction of how programs work. Um, the other language that I work in is JavaScript. And JavaScript's paradigms. Oh, how do we feel about it, people? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of functional JavaScript. If I have to write JavaScript, I try to make it as functional as possible. And I, I have a hard time with the object-oriented, the way JavaScript supports object orientation, although it's getting better, I think. I think it's better now. But, um, but what's important to me is working in a language that allows me to kind of use the right abstraction for a problem. However, sometimes it can be a bit of a relief if you know that a particular language is a really good fit 
uh, sorry, a particular paradigm is a really good fit for the problem that you're working on. It can also be great to work in a language that forces you to stick to that paradigm. Like, for example, a language I'm really excited about and curious about is Elm. Are any Elmers here? Anybody? No? Okay, so Elm is a functional front-end language um, that uh, forces you to stay in the functional paradigm. And if you know that this is a good model for you, that can take a load off because you don't have to worry all the time, okay, uh, do I need to rethink this decision about which paradigm I should be using right now? Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Oh. oh. Hello. Who are you? <laughs> you look really familiar. Hello. Hi there. Um, incommensurability. Sorry? Incommensurability. Incommensurability. That's a word. <laughs> it's it's unnecessary. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so one of the premises of uh, the paradigm shifts is this idea that there's incommensurability between paradigms. You can't jump from one to the other. So in the, in the Kuhnian sense, yes. you mean? Yeah. But in, I think the challenge that we face in this way of framing um, paradigm shift is this: you adopt a way of programming and then you need to move over to a different way of programming. So how do you bridge that divide? Like, What are your tricks to going from object-oriented to uh, one of the other types of languages and adopting all of them rather than just one? Yeah, so that, I think uh, that's a great question. It's kind of getting at this idea of, OK, is this extra kind of work? Is this extra stress on us, like trying to mentally shift between paradigms? Yeah, it certainly can be. And especially, like I said, when you've, um, when you've kind of committed to one paradigm for a particular project, and you've decided, you've sort of evaluated different options, and you've decided that for this particular project, I want to work in functional programming, or I, I think that an object-oriented approach is right for this. If, like I said, if you're constantly kind of reevaluating that and trying to switch back and forth, that can certainly put an extra tax on you and, and make the act of programming a bit harder. Um, I think when you, when you mentioned the incommensurability of paradigms in the Kuhnian sense, the idea that you can't do both Einsteinian physics and Newtonian physics at the same time, definitely true. It's hard to write a program that is both uh, declarative and imperative. However, as I said, other pairs of paradigms, like object-oriented and functional, Depending on the situation, sometimes you can kind of look at it as like, it's a duck, it's a rabbit, it's a duck, it's a rabbit. It's sort of, you could flip between those abstractions and consider the program from two different perspectives, but it's the same program. It works in the same way, but it could fit multiple paradigms. So I think that um, the best way to approach that is to, once you've settled into a paradigm for a particular thing, to embrace it, like I said and to try and create everything within the framework of that paradigm and really think carefully about those moments where you want to break out of it. Make sure that that's only something you are prepared to do when the cost of maintaining your current paradigm is just too high. It has to be a pretty big anomaly to make you shift mentally from one paradigm to the other. And I find, like, for example, um, JavaScript, I mentioned, is a, is a paradigm, uh, sorry, a, a language that supports multiple paradigms. Like, for example, you could be using a library in JavaScript that does, that, that, that's useful for functional programming. But some of these libraries, because we usually write JavaScript code with this more object-oriented notation, method calls, objects, method calls, things like that, um, sometimes you'll find like, for example, in um, Immutable JS, if anyone works with that library, you'll find a library that's trying to do something functional and trying to help you build your programs in a functional way, but using an interface or using this, this kind of style that feels a bit more object-oriented. To me, that produces this kind of cognitive dissonance, and it, it becomes like, what am I doing? Am I doing object-oriented? Am I doing functional? How should I be thinking about this? And so I prefer to work in... Uh, with a library that's going to force me to write pure functions and not uh, call things that look like methods on objects but are really just pure functions in disguise. And so I would rather have that be cleanly separated and know that I'm either working functionally or I'm working in OO. Hope that was a sufficient rambling answer to your very short and eloquent question. Thank you for the question. 
Last right. call for questions. Yeah. Don't want to stand between you and your coffee. So if anyone else does want to chat about programming philosophy or anything else or any of the, uh, the things I mentioned at the beginning, those programs, just come find me afterwards. Thanks again, Anjana.